I'm really pleased that for today's In Conversation With, I'm joined by Mark, who is MA Creativity Making and Innovation Practice Course Leader, MA MSc Future Media and BA Digital Marketing Senior Lecturer at Birmingham City University. Mark brings over 25 years experience in digital channels, creative innovation and emerging technologies. He is a leading innovation strategist working with global brands, startups and third sector organisations. Mark's focus is on the creative application of technology in which he's researching and developing concepts for the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. This has led to projects in creative innovation, music and dementia and sustainable circular fashion. Mark leads, which is really interesting, Make a Monday, a monthly creative inspiration event that is part of BCU's Steam House programme. He is also another STEAM fellow working on an initiative to develop simple contextual objects called the One Pixel Project. And I am really happy to have Mark here today for this in conversation with. Thank you. Yes, I'm very happy to be here. That was, that was a very long introduction. I'm not sure <laughs> well, you have done a lot of stuff, that. Mark. <laughs> you have done a lot of stuff and a lot of creative I think the complexity with the introduction <laughs> is actually the problem that I have, which is trying to define the work and the discipline that I sit in. And Absolutely. I think that's actually quite real. I think the problem with my introduction is exactly the challenge that I see around interdisciplinary working. Expand on that a little bit more then. Let, let, um, let's start our conversation there. I feel, and, and I think universities are particularly good at this, I feel that we're all, yeah, I feel that we're all put into, you know, I remember when I first, start at university that the question was what's your discipline and that we have quite a narrow path and obviously we sit in faculties and we're in school within faculties that sort of essentially defines what you do and I really like the fact that I'm somebody who started my career in kind of digital media marketing advertising and now um, my, my professional practice work is around dementia and helping to support people living with dementia and to look at it from the outside, it's like, why on earth did somebody who started in a different discipline end up doing this? And yet, to me, it makes complete sense because my interest is about how people interact through technology and through media. And the whole of my career has been looking at the emerging side of that. So to me, it makes complete sense. But to explain it to someone outside, particularly in, in an institution that seems to be very focused on disciplines, is the struggle that I have. So that's really interesting. I'm going to diverge a little bit from the questions that we kind of spoken about that we would explore a little bit for this in conversation with. And I think what you're starting to tap into there is how disciplines are structured. Let's just focus on higher education for now that um, with a lot of courses you go on and you study one particular course potentially there's not that much interaction say between art and health faculty and I know that some of our fellow colleagues um, are trying to explore that a little bit further but do you think that that's the way that higher education should start to be going to be more transdisciplinarity to be more kind of focused across subjects rather than continuing this kind of silo nature of art sciences for example absolutely without doubt and i do think don't get me wrong i think universities understand the need to do this i think mm -hmm. if you were to suggest this to anyone within a university they would all agree with this mm -hmm. and i've heard this come from the top of my very faculty talking a lot more about interdisciplinary work but trying to deliver it in practice seems to be a very difficult thing Mm -hmm. I think in part it's due to the nature of the universities, they're very large bureaucratic organisations and as a university whenever I work with anybody who is outside the organisation, you know, I have, I, there's a long sigh about, you know, the can you just, I'm like, no, it's a university, there is no can you just about it, that there's, you know, quite complex structures that, that are there and some of them have very good reason, I understand why we have structures around, for example, the qualification of degrees, um, because we need to ensure the, the, the sort of credibility and the academic rigour in terms of what we do. And I'm fine with all of that, but unfortunately, you know, sitting around this, are the, these kind of structures that I think tend to stifle, they tend to act against interdisciplinary working. So I think the overall willingness is there, but I think the practice is quite difficult. 
So how does something like Make a Monday fit into this realm in the sense that, you know, it brings together professionals, artists, students, staff from BCU. What does that sort of space offer? Um, I, th I think it offers exactly what you've just said. I mean, the first thing about Make a Monday is that um, we don't really, we don't talk about disciplines at all. We don't talk about our jobs. I sort of kind of mention BCU and Steamhouse because that's essentially who's, who's funding it. But it's kind of mentioned in passing, fundamentally, we're all people with a common interest, which is around making innovation and creatively driven ideas. And really, we focus very much on the common interest. And we try to, we basically ignore what people's backgrounds are, um, because I think that's not relevant. And again, I don't, we don't differentiate between whether somebody's staff, student, or, or a more sort of uh, a public, let's say, uh, side of, of, of the West Midlands. I mean, that's, you know, our commonality is what we're interested in not what we not what our discipline is or our training so that's a really interesting starting point for bringing people together i'm wondering then how how do you start off a session when everybody's coming in with an interest in an idea but what's the role say of creativity in that process if it is more idea driven um I mean, for me, and it's not just Make a Monday, this is kind of everything that I do, is that sort of creativity kind of sits around all of it. Because if we define creativity essentially as connecting things differently, and I'm borrowing, that's, that's the Steve Jobs phrase, of it, uh, phrase for it, but it, you, know, you can describe it in many different ways, then essentially that's all we're trying to do is we're trying to find different ways to connect things, ways that might not have done before or perhaps taking things that have been done before and finding ways to kind of develop and iterate them. But for me, creativity sits around all of that. And the thing that I would say is that any discipline, if we, if we get, let's accept for now that we have disciplines, <laughs> and, 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 and different areas. And in fact, yeah, any discipline yeah. at its most innovative end is a creative exercise. And that would include yeah, yeah. maths, <laughs> physics, engineering, all of those things. Um, and in fact, certainly in, in, in sort of the most more advanced areas of something like physics, the idea that there's kind of rules that you have to stick by is kind of gone. And it's very much about a creative approach to understanding what's going on. So I think that that whole creativity under, enables us to connect things differently, but also enables us to understand things in a different way. So I think that kind of kind of encompasses it sits around everything that I do, and I think everything that we should be doing around uh, anything that's uh, innovative or new. And obviously, with Make a Monday, it's a. Uh... It's a space that is away from any, as you're kind of talking about, rules, regulations. It's away from any form of assessment. It is really just a space for people to generate ideas. Yeah, and there were always, I mean, when we came up with the idea for Maker Monday, and it was one of my colleagues in what was, what it still is, really Research Innovation Enterprise, but now part of Steamhouse, or Steamhouse is now part of that. Um, and we talked about doing this event. Sort of the only rules were that there weren't any rules in the sense that, you know, well, no, actually there was one rule, which is that we had to provide beer and pizza. <laughs> That's because a very all, good rule. But I think it's really important because although it seems sort of fun and frivolous, I've always be believed by that getting a group of, you know, quite disparate people in a room together and getting them, you know, with a drink and, a, and something to eat is probably the best way to create a collaborative environment. And that actually delivering kind of really set structures, we must do it in this way, is, um, is not conducive to that kind of collaboration and that kind of interdisciplinary working. The other thing that we do is, um, and the thing uh, that I started doing when we were meeting face to face, and we still, we still do it online, is give people permission to talk to others so I always do some kind of icebreaker, and it's usually a question relating to the thing, the, the topic of that particular week. And then I say, if it's in the room, I say to people, find someone in the room you don't know and talk about this for five minutes. And by doing that, by giving people permission to talk to each other, you've kind of opened up the collaboration. 
and we do something equivalent to that online which is with zoom we just randomly shove people into small small groups in the rooms for five minutes known as i call it the one minute mingle because everybody's supposed to just speak for a minute don't think it always works like that um but i think that's a really important thing to do at the start and something that actually came out last week uh doing not, not make a monday but doing the, the the steam lab the pilot that we wanted to do for this online uh lab was that we decided not to do any introductions other than to just say our names. And the reason for that was simply that we, when you get something like this and somebody appears as an expert, it can be intimidating to those who aren't. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, look, let's try and keep this quite sort of level. And we just all say, hi, my name's Mark. I mean, I, I asked them to pick a thing, the most useless object in their house as their way of introducing themselves. But it was none of it was about their, their kind of their biography or their expertise, because we, we didn't feel that, that was appropriate to creating the kind of collaboration that we were looking for. Yeah, all of that's really interesting, Mark. I mean, this fellowship is, is really looking at the curriculum kind of early years all the way through. And I think what you're talking about there is really important, the connections between people and how we generate and allow those collaborations to happen I mean particularly in the phases of education I've worked in primary secondary and so forth that connection with other teachers is not necessarily always offered particularly for arts teachers who are often kind of the only arts teacher within the school um, so that really kind of um, is something that I'll think about further in terms of if we're designing curriculums or um, trying to think about thematic uh, projects, then those connections with other teachers, students, uh, professionals, it needs to be on a kind of shared basis and taking away any of that kind of former previous past experiences and entering something anew is a really nice way of going forward. Yeah, and I, and I think that's really important. And, and yeah, as you're talking, I'm immediately thinking of uh, Ken Robinson and his his famous TED talk and his other work about how actually, you know, when you're very young, you don't really have these perceptions of whether you're a creative person or not, or you just, you know, you just give it a go. Absolutely. What we're actually trying to do in these sorts of situations like Make a Monday or within university teaching is sort of get people away from all the sort of the things that have been put upon them, dare I say the hang-ups that we have, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. actually being prepared to let go. That's probably, in my teaching work, that's probably what I teach people the most. Absolutely. There's a real need, um, and actually in quite a number of these conversations that we get into we get taught into particular ways of thinking, being and doing within the classroom that then when we get students into higher education, we do have to try to teach them sometimes out of those processes in order to be more open um, to new possibilities that, you know, it's not a case of I will directly deliver you this content, you do a test and come back and you pass or fail, that actually university beyond in the world of work life doesn't work like that yeah yeah and that, and that's absolutely yeah and i couldn't i mean again the pass fail thing is is yet another thing that i'm very on board with which is that it isn't should be about passing and failing it should just be about achieving certain goals that you're looking to get to mm -hmm. just going back slightly just because it uh, occurred to me is that probably the thing that frustrates me the most is when i hear people saying oh i'm not creative because and that I feel is because we are sort of pushed into certain disciplines and like that's a creative discipline that isn't a creative discipline and currently particularly I think there is a sense that somehow creative disciplines have less value mm -hmm. than the ones that are seen to be scientific or engineering based um, the I think it was last year I think it was June last year there was that survey in um, one of the newspapers, probably the Daily Mail, about you know what jobs do you value the most? And there's obviously nurses and teachers, and then artists were the least valued. And I'm like, well, hang on a minute, <laughs> you know, this is a very nicely designed infographic. Who did that infographic? You know, how do you know where do the ideas come up from if you don't do if you don't have that value? And I think so. I think that's the problem. Is I think sometimes creative creative endeavors creativity is seen as having somehow having less value and it's kind of pushed down so that people start to say oh well i'm not creative 
Mm -hmm. Or it is absolutely just aligned with the arts and actually yeah. it stretches yeah. Yeah. beyond the yeah. arts and, you know, creativity is across all subjects. What you've just mentioned there, though, about um, valuing creativity reminded me very much of um, one of my favourite um, writers on creativity, Margaret Bowden, who classifies creativity in two ways. P, creativity, which is psychological. So basically, it's creative for that person if it is something that they have never experienced before. And that is valuable. So therefore, in everyday creativity, it has value within the classroom or the learning situation. And then there's H creativity, which, you know, your Einstein's, you know, it's historical kind of value. But neither cre creativity is, is better than the other. It's just an experience. And if it is something new for that person, then it has value. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I completely agree with that as an idea. But I think the challenge, and when I always hear the, oh, well, I'm not creative, uh, my answer is always, well, you're not creative yet. You know, you maybe haven't found it yet, or maybe you don't feel you found it, but it is there, it does exist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that notion of um, I'm not creative, I think that also comes down to a lack of understanding of what creativity is. I think there is that distinction that it, it has to be kind of, a big grand idea and actually being creative is a young child playing with some mud and a bucket in the corner of a room and exploring how you know the mud falls and mm. gravity that's creative and I think there needs to be a wider understanding still even in education around what creativity actually is there's still a lot of work to be done around that yeah and I think that and when you talk about young children and obviously play is a, a, both a, a very important and a highly creative endeavor and I think you know as as adults and in universities we don't play enough there needs to be more play and essentially I guess you know when I talk about beer and pizza at Maker Monday it's about that idea about playing mm -hmm. absolutely that's what I mean it's a it's a space and time to engage in something like that. And, um, you know, in play, it doesn't matter if you make a mistake, you take risks, you know, and all of that are creative processes. So I think this notion of make a Monday and offering that time and space is, yeah, is a really great idea. And it's great that it's part of the university, but it extends beyond that into mm. wider communities as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes. I mean, I think that... Um, just say, just say what you just said again, the last bit before before the bit about Make a Monday. Something occurred to me as you were saying that. We're talking about play and the, oh, doing things you've never done before <laughs> and making mistakes. It's certainly in, in, in the kinds of areas that I'm working with more around innovation, because we're trying to do new stuff, you have to fail. Mm -hmm. And so failure is a fundamental part of the process to what we do. Mm -hmm. And again, I think there is that, you know, another frustrating thing that I hear with students who are learning is, oh, did I do that wrong? Mm -hmm. it's like, no, there isn't a wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an answer. There may be another solution. Um, but actually, you know, that learning how to fail again is another thing that I think is, is probably sort of pushed out of us at quite a young age. And Absolutely. it's something you have to bring back into any any creative, innovation, artistic uh, practice. It's something that, you know, it has to be fundamental to that. Absolutely. So to ask you a kind of general question, going back to our kind of questions that we, we discussed uh, before this in conversation with, what do you then see as the role of the A in STEAM? Um, I'm glad you asked this question because it's something that I've, I've seen as very important and very significant for a long time. Because although uh, the A stands for arts, to me that is every single bit of uh, uh, kind of creative work that sits around that is actually fundamental to the other, the other bits of STEAM, the science and the technology and the engineering and the maths. And without the A bit, for me, they become meaningless because all, all you would ever be able to do is to just repeat and, 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 and do things that have gone before. But if you want to have genuinely novel, innovative experiences, then you have to bring in the art side of it. 
So what is it about the arts that does it have a distinctive quality about it? What does it, how does it enrich STEM subjects? Why, what is unique or is there anything unique about the arts or does it interplay very well with those other subjects? I think it, I think it, I think it does interplay very well. I think it, 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 it's, as I say, to me, it's absolutely fundamental to that. I think it's difficult. I think what I'm struggling with is the idea that the arts are somehow a separate thing mm -hmm. that you you bring into the, uh, the the other STEM subjects? The other yeah, mm -hmm. the, the arts is somehow something to bring into it, whereas to me, it's something that should be very much embedded to it and sits around it. And again, it comes back to that thing pretty much I said at the, at the start. I think the job of the arts is to be able to connect things differently and think differently, and not to follow what's gone before. And so I think that's why its role is absolutely key to all of this. So do you think adding in the A then has been a, a, a good thing? I mean, obviously, in terms of education, it's a good thing in that it is placing value with the arts. But if the arts are kind of central to everything, is there a need to have STEM and STEAM? In an ideal world, no. As in an ideal world, we shouldn't have disciplines. I mean, I would I describe myself as not just against disciplines. I, I call myself undisciplined. And I think <laughs> an, I an un, undisciplined approach is is what I would like to see in an ideal world. I think that would work very well. Why should it be? Well, now I'm doing science. Now I'm doing something creative. Oh, and over here is engineering. There may be specific problems to solve along the way that may be science problems, they might be maths problems. And, and I get that. But why should we have to kind of separate all of that process? So in an ideal world, we shouldn't have STEM or STEAM at all. And I think, and, and, and I, I don't know, well, I do see things in the States where they look at everything as a broad discipline. Um, and I wonder whether the UK is uniquely skilled at creating these little um, uh, narrow fields. For example, you know, we start um, specializing at A-level. To some extent, even at GCSE, you know, we start pigeonholing, oh, you're a scientist, you're not a scientist. You know, you have value, you don't have value. Um, and that just carries all the way through. So I think it would be better to get rid of it completely. But I understand that, that STEAM needs to exist as a sort of description that could perhaps be understood more widely to the world. Brilliant. So what is the value of this kind of interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary way of working for your students, say, for example, at Birmingham City University? What value does that have? Um, Fundamentally, what I see is doing a, a university should be doing is doing is creating people who are analytical and critical and curious and are able to synthesize to be able to bring different ideas together and to create new ideas. And I think that's really sort of underpinning everything that we're trying to do. And for me to create that, you know, people who are kind of well rounded critical thinkers. Um, that's what cross-disciplinary does. But let me put it more in a, in a, in a sort of a, a practical way, which is, you know, so many of the jobs that people do right now are jobs that didn't exist even a few years ago. You know, a TikToker, which is a job, you can't apply for it, you have to kind of build your audience, but nonetheless, you know, people who are social media influencers, that didn't exist before. And with that, all of the other disciplines that kind of certain disciplines, God, I didn't even mean to say disciplines, but all the other jobs and roles that sit around that and kind of managing all of these kinds of things, people working with kind of, you know, data and algorithms. There's so many things that didn't exist. Even, even I don't know, um, I'll, I'll pick a random example, you know, a, 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 an artisanal micro bakery which has been start, started by someone, you know, I have a friend who did exactly this during lockdown. You know, that, that you know, th there is a specific set of skills there, but to get there and to develop that requires the, these kind of broad uh, understandings and these broad kind of analytical approaches that we need to go forwards. So just drawing on your experiences of, you know, 
the world of work and employment and that transition from, you know, studying at higher education or going straight into the world of work from uh, formal education. Why is STEAM learning important for future employment then? Um, well, for starters, you know, when I look at my career, and I'm sure you and many others are the same, is that, you know, I didn't intend to be where I am now. I had no, you know, I started, I mean, essentially, I've done probably now four or five different things in my career, admittedly all within a similar area, but I know people who, you know, gone from, you know, one particular profession to something that's an entirely different. So I think what we have now, and I think that's partly about economic structures. I think the idea that you go into a job and you do that job for life, that's that's long gone. Mm -hmm. So we're in, you know, and we are very much in a changing world and a changing environment. And I think STEAM is something that can give people those sets of skills. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the work that I do is very, very technical. Some of the work that I do is very creative and to be able to just move between those different areas and be comfortable with doing that is absolutely essential to the kind of contemporary world of work that we have. I really like what you've just said there about the ability to move, to be quite fluid in the way that you um, can interact with things and I think that goes back to what we were talking about earlier that the problem with education at the moment is that we are pigeonholing people into specific disciplines and I really like the notion of undisciplined. That's something we need to do. We need to offer young people the opportunity to be able to be quite fluid in their education. But this is this is the issue, isn't it, that actually the university is starting to think about this and move in this way. You know, Steam House is a great initiative to link communities, professionals together with young people, students, staff. But for me and my particular interest is that unless we start to do that early on in our education, that's not going to happen. And we have a bigger job working in HE to try to unlearn those processes. Yeah, and, and I think you're, you're, you're completely right there. I think, I mean, I mean, all of this has to start much earlier in the education process. And I wonder, that, given what you've just said, whether actually a lot of what we're trying to do at university in this sort of area is basically attempting to undo stuff that has gone on in their previous education. Oh, are, are we actually the process? I definitely think that's our role and responsibility. Yeah. So maybe fellows, we're not teaching, we're, we're actually unlearning. That's what we're trying to do here. Undiscipline, as you say, I think uh, I think that's a cracking expression. Absolutely, Mark. So, I suppose the last kind of question then is: is why is STEAM learning important for the twenty first century? And I ask that question because, as you rightly said, we're at a really kind of critical moment in time right now. We have gone through, or we're not even through the pandemic yet. We've had eighteen months of severe radical change so what what value does steam have now even more post pandemic and that i think that's a really important question to ask because i think the first thing is is that we have gone through radical change and even from the perspective of technology we saw essentially a 10-year uh, i'll say adoption rather than the development of technology but a 10-year adoption in probably a month and that's never happened in any of our lifetimes before. And through that, not just through the adoption of technology, but it's allowed us to question the whole world of work. What is the point in offices? Why do we need to go in offices? I've said for many years, you know, offices are fundamentally, their job is fundamentally about compliance. We want people sitting there doing, essentially most people go into the office and do little more than send emails. That's fundamentally a lot of people's job. And it's like, well, why are you wasting money on these really expensive offices for people to sit there and send emails? They could be doing at home. They could be at home. They could be like, like I have done. That I had to say this is lockdown, but you know, baking bread in between my team's calls and my emails, um, and the teaching, of course. Um, and I and I feel more more fulfilment and more of a sense of value to my life. So then the question is, is you know, why why is work structured like this? What are we doing, and why are we here? You know, when we're going to the office, what is the point of going into the office? 
And there is quite a strong move, uh, because I have been doing some research around this, to say, well, actually, what office space should be for is for collaboration. And essentially what they're saying is really offices should be there for that creative bit that you're not going to do. You know, sending, you know, sending emails is probably not a very creative endeavour. But so when you come to the office, what you should be doing is spending your time being more creative, thinking about stuff, communicating with your colleagues, having the accidental conversations that you cannot have, or this is almost impossible to have on Zoom and Teams, mm -hmm. and, and valuing it in that way. And then there's the whole, you know, how much time am I spending at work? How, what time am I spending with my family? You know, somebody's got a dog. You know, their dog's now spent 18 months of them being at home. I mean, what are you going to do when you go out to work now? Um, how you, you know, and, and, and so I think there is a, I, I do believe there is a broad reassessment of, of what's happened. I think to some extent we will go, eventually go back to what we, some of what we were doing before, but other things have changed. And I think the reason why I'm using the office environment, the office culture here as an example, is I think that's something that will prop change uh, differently. So some industries, interestingly, the tech industries have kind of said, no, you don't ever have to come to the office again. Some industries are at the other end of it. But generally speaking, we're going to spend less time working in the way that we did before. So Absolutely, how, this, this hybrid nature is very exactly, much the way forward. Exactly, that, that. So how do you make that work effectively? Well, I think it's very much that kind of collaborative STEAM approach. Um, one of the things that's come out of this, this pandemic has been the concept of DIY innovation, that people have both had the time and the interest. You know, necessity has pushed people to try to solve complex problems, often in smaller groups than themselves. And the thing about DIY innovation is you don't have to be an expert in that subject to do that thing. So I think the idea of kind of subjects and expertise, I think, are beginning to dwindle a bit within the professional world. I think we're, we're sort of questioning about the structure of work and why we're doing stuff and, you know, why can't I be a, you know, mic, you know, run a micro bakery and, and, and do engineering at the same time, you know, what's to stop me doing that? And I think really STEAM is something that can kind of help, um, I don't really want to use the word manage, but you can kind of, kind of support that transition as we go through it because it kind of gives you that understanding, that interdisciplinary working that, that we will need. Thank you so much, Mark. You have offered so much insight. It's been really great to chat to you. Thank you Thanks. so much for doing this in conversation with. And obviously, you, you've got your um, STEAM Fellowship too, so lots of people can engage with the One Pixel project and when that's all uploaded on STEAM House too as well. So mm -hmm. everybody yeah. should go and have a look at that too. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mark.